Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 798. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is March 28th, 2023. All right, you're watching another episode of Anglican Unscripted. I think we're, uh, let's do the quick math here. We're too short of 800. And that's crazy. That is absolutely crazy. And I really want people to know the background of what happens, how we do a pre-show here. And a pre-show is basically George and I talking over the top stories of the week, going to Anglican.inc where we get most of our stories, and deciding what order to put them in, what to talk about, stuff like that. And then right before we do the show, there's two important things we do. We pray for about 20 or 30 minutes about the show, about people uh, who are viewers who are struggling right now, and we also take the pre-show bathroom break. Probably the most important thing for two 50-year-old-ish guys who are going to sit for an hour and talk about all things Anglican, because I can't sit here at minute 42 and say, uh, George, hold on one second. Keep that thought. I, I, I got to take a run. So... Um, before you get too far into this episode, like right now, please click that like button over there. There's one on Facebook. There's one on YouTube. That is free advertising for us. That tells uh, Facebook and YouTube this is something to be watched and promoted. And we've had a couple of videos go viral. We've had the uh, uh, Asbury Revival and a couple others uh, have really done some um, good numbers out there. I had a commenter ask, why do you have 8,400 subscribers and only 3,500 viewers? Well, we have a global audience, and not everybody wants to, to listen to when we, the topic is about American Anglicanism or English Anglicanism. or So you, they'll look for the title, do I want to watch that or not? So that that's kind of how that works. George, how are you doing this week? What? Yeah? Fine. It, it, if I may make a suggestion, we'll just have, this is the Justin Bieber. Is he an Anglican? <laughs> Kim Kardashian. See if we can get that all-important teenage girl uh, uh, demographic on board, yeah. Anglican. I am I am uh, doing great. We were get, late getting started today because I had person after person come into my office this morning with questions, the choir master, the organist, the deacons, the, the administrator about Palm Sunday and all the different services next week. And and I just, I'm very irritating because I'm relaxed about all this stuff. God's in charge. It will be wonderful. But how many stanzas of all glory, Lord, and honor do we sing? And <laughs> and uh, will, will we have palm fronds on Saturday night now, as well as Sunday? All that wonderful stuff. And I got to tell you, it's a wonderful life being a priest because you get to live and love with people who share the most important thing in your life, which is the faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And, um, and well, Kevin mentioned that we pray for people before we start the show. We, I got an email, I got a Facebook message from a, a viewer who feels under attack from his bishop, and Kevin and I just prayed for him. And do you know what an honor it is to be able to do that? I just am so very highly honored to be able to, to pray for people who have never met in the flesh sometimes. Um, I'm nattering, I'm babbling, Kevin. No, Stop no, it, but the, it's true. I mean, one of the, the important parts of what we do here at Anglican Scripted is to be sure that we practice what we preach. I mm -hmm. am a Christian believer in the living God and the resurrected Christ, okay? And I try as much as I can as a sinner, as a broken person, as a pr every time I press that little record button, I'm way over my head. But when somebody asks me to pray for them, of course. When I have to say I'm sorry and repent of something, of course, because we and practice so, what we preach. Sometimes people who don't haven't watched for a while may get the wrong impression about us where 90% of our emotional energies are directed to being annoyed at Justin Welby for wherever he's done. It's actually the reverse. 90% of our lives are wonderful, joyful, powerful. And then we have our children, so that takes up eight percent and then just as well becomes in about one or two percent <laughs> yes, of our emotional energies uh, uh, yeah. so but 
So when we talk about these difficult things, it's not because we uh, ruminate them over in dark rooms for hours at a time, but rather these are the issues that are shooting across the communion. And when we will have, when I believe, you know, things are getting worse around the world. Evil is rampant. And because of that, most of our stories will touch upon that. Yeah, absolutely. And you and I experience evil outside of the, the, the drama of um, Anglican politics. Right now, we're having a, a family crisis with one of my children. Happens a lot. In fact, when I'm talking to other people, oh, you, you haven't been canceled yet by a, a, a son or daughter. Well, here's my canceled letter. And I show them my canceled letter. And I go, I thought I was the only one. Oh, Kevin, you're being silly. We're oh, Woke children are canceling all of us. You know, And the, here's the template. Oh, I, I, that's the template she used. And so it's oh. just, oh, man. So, and so when I hear about Justin Welby or some other uh, bishop or the we talk about apostate bishops, I do this knowing that, sadly, you know, here in, in America, in, in Florida, we're having small family drama issues over there. These are bishops that we're talking about who are canceling Orthodox priests. And that's very mm -hmm. difficult to talk about. Even mm -hmm. though it doesn't affect me, it's affecting priests and deacons and their churches and the faith mm -hmm. of those who are looking for leadership in the church. Mm -hmm. So I think we're talking about our stories before we get to our stories. That was a quick behind the scenes with a uh, uh, Kevin and George who have empty bladders. Thank God. Uh, first story, George. Evil is on the rise in the Church of England. Yeah, okay, not just the Church of England. E evil is on the rise everywhere, but we're seeing more and more. Seeing more and more uh, that there's false safeguarding charges, apostate bishops the living love and faith tragedy uh and right now this is the, the the month of the woman i'm seeing women biological women are just not measuring up if if asked in questions i would say woke and transgenderism is the new glass ceiling for women george i've been waiting to steal that phrase that's my you, line i like it so much <laughs> <laughs> we uh, where does one begin? We, uh, where well, we have this the shooting yesterday at Covenant Presbyterian Church, where a woman, a 28 year old woman who is taking testosterone shots, uh, not to become all buff and manly, but because she's she she believed she was a man inside, mm -hmm. went to a school, a Christian school she had attended as a child, and and committed a hate crime. This was a deliberate act targeting Christians, targeting children, targeting a church she attended. And she murdered uh, three children, ages eight and nine, and three teachers. And she was shot by the police who responded rapidly and took her out. And she has a manifesto with her hate. And uh, Tennessee recently passed a law uh, banning transgender uh, surgeries on those under 18. You have to wait till you're, you've reached your legal emancipation age before you can make a choice to be have your top redone or your bottom redone, whatever they call it. And part of her anger was that Christians have been leading the charge against this. And so she killed children. Uh, let's go halfway around the world. Uh, there's an English woman's activist named Posey Parker which is a pseudonym. It sounds like a character from a Batman or Superman comic, Posey yeah. Parker. She uh, has been giving speeches in Australia and New Zealand about the threat to women by this rise of transgenderism. And it's not just, you know, woman sportsman of the year, Leah Thomas, a uh, male swimmer, uh, but she's essentially is mobbed to death. And the police stand by, and it's only because uh, she had uh, the protection of security guards, she was not killed. And you see the evil and the anger and the hatred of these mentally disturbed men who believe they're women, who denounce this woman uh, for stating what is the truth. 
when the, the sleep of reason is insanity is an old phrase and we see it on display in New Zealand we saw it yesterday in Nashville Tennessee and we see it in the Church of England uh, Sam Margrave a member of General Synod a friend of this show uh, has uh, put forward several proper legal complaints against now openly gay, partnered, married, deacons, people just ordained who now see that all, all restraints are off uh, about uh, Stephen Cottrell putting forward for ordination a woman who is trans, who isn't even baptized yet. Oh, she'll get baptized. Yeah, oh, we'll take care of that. Um, and in return, the bishops are shutting down Sam Margrave it's synod in diocesan synod it's becoming a little north korean happy clappy things where you go to diocesan synod in some places in england and everybody claps in unison after the bishop the great dear leader gives his speech there's no pushback from the laity they're so beaten up we had a, as i mentioned an email a text message from a priest who will probably get false safeguarding charges thrown against him by a bishop because this priest is standing up for the truth that what is revealed in scripture, what is known from science, well, we can't have somebody like that in our diocese, so we'll get rid of them. And so we have the archdeacon sniffing around asking the few cranks in the diocese, well, you know, when did he stop beating his wife? Sort of questions. Now, this isn't new. About a year or two ago, we talked about a man named John Kurt, K U H R T, in the Diocese of Southwark, who reported uh, abuse taking place and the diocese did nothing and he brought it to the attention of public authorities and because of that he was brought up on safeguarding charges because he embarrassed the diocese the church of england uses safeguarding now as a weapon to persecute orthodox clergy whereas you can have a bishop a two-time loser on safeguarding the bishop of uh, birmingham be appointed the archbishop's advisor a bishop to the archbishops and when they're called out on that, oh, well, 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 it, we never meant him to have that job. I mean, there's an evil, uh, evil. I don't mean to be melodramatic, but Satan is on the march within our institutions, within our culture, within our society. Now, part of it is that time is getting short and Satan's only got a limited time to achieve his ends before Christ returns. But by the same token, those who are called to faithfulness are, are going to be facing the test. The time of time of testing is coming for all of us. And it's hard to watch this because so many are failing the easy test. Mm -hmm. The easy test is, is this wrong? And a reason, you know, is transgenderism wrong? Or is uh, uh, anything LGBTQ uh, wrong? Or opposed by scripture or opposed by science reason psychology anthropology all the sciences and you say yes well you'll be attacked and canceled for agreeing with the muses of the day and not uh the zeitgeist of the day and but the, the zeitgeist is i would say specifically anti-christian oh absolutely yeah. richard richard dawkins the noted uh bio physicist, biochemist, and atheist. Atheist. Famous for his atheism. atheism. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, well, he was, I think it was Piers Morgan or one of the British chat shows. Yeah. And he said, transgenderism is absolute nonsense. It's an X, you know, chromosomes. There's a choice, one of the other. Mm -hmm. And Richard Dawkins can say this because he's a good atheist. Or we can run up to Scotland. Uh, I'm jumping out of order of our... Well, I wait a minute here. My outline doesn't say you can do that yet. But go ahead. We, we jump up to Scotland, and I have no interest whatsoever in local politics in Scotland. Whoever they elect as dog catchers, fine by me. But the uh, leader of the SNP, Scottish National Party, which is uh, the governing party in the uh, Scottish devolved parliament, resigned, and there was a race between two people, a woman named Katie Forbes and a man named... Uh, Humza Yusuf. And the press, BBC, The Guardian, the Scottish newspapers, uh, pilloried Katie Forbes because she is a member of the We Freeze, uh, the Free Church of Scotland. 
she happens to have traditional Christian moral beliefs, but is a very happy, successful politician in the Scottish National Party. Now, Hamza Youssef is a Muslim who has Muslim moral beliefs. And the Muslim moral belief on transgenderism and homosexuality and the gay issues are almost fairly consistent with the we freeze views yeah but, short of but, we don't yeah the, the christians don't kill yes yeah, yeah okay. they don't the, the, yeah. the christians do not throw homosexuals off the off tall buildings to kill yes. them. Yeah. now what does the bbc focus on oh can a woman who has traditional christian views be in politics that question is asked 20 times a day and so when the election was held, she lost 52 to 48 percent among those voting in the party. Now, I don't know the intricacies. I don't know how this works. And I don't know if her conservatism on faith issues spreads to other issues. I don't frankly care. But when Youssef won, the BBC all of a sudden discovered he was a Muslim and said how wonderful it is that we have someone whose fa family came from the Indian subcontinent now uh, in Scotland, leading one of the political parties. And he's a Muslim. Isn't that wonderful? Shows our diversity. Whereas if a Forbes had won, she would continue to be pilloried as some ignorant Christian fanatic. That's the spirit of evil, of chaos, of destruction loosed in the world, where the culture allows this but the problem here is nobody has anybody's back anymore in a cancel culture right mm -hmm. now nobody's standing up to defend the christians to mm -hmm. say uh no you're, you're you're being kind of ridiculous in your attack on this christian because of blah 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 there's no defense there's because <sighs> people are afraid to be canceled i will not put my hand up and say oh we shouldn't really uh, uh, persecute this person because they're a Christian, because then I'll be persecuted just for raising my hand. And that chaos that, that Satan knows so well, he is placed upon not just the church, but Western culture. You know, Western culture who used to give us the benefit of the doubt, who, who used to say, well, you know, constitutionally, we protect Christianity and we respect it for uh, what it's brought here to uh, Europe and uh, the Americas through just being a, a, a religion of liberty and freedom and grace and mercy. We, we protect and honor that. That's gone. That's absolutely and gone. Sam, one of Sam Gret Margrave's issues was that he brought up at General Synod the problem, or he attempted to bring up the problem of the abortion free zones and the arrest of Elizabeth von Spruce and uh, others for praying silently near uh, abortion zones, free speech and thought crimes. Oh, General Synod, we were not gonna allow that, the business committee said, because that's a local issue. Well, in uh, diocesan synod, oh, we're not gonna allow you to talk about that, that's a national issue. The bishops and their functionaries, their drones are entirely enthralled to this Moloch, this god of death and destruction that is running the Church of England. If I didn't know better, I would think Justin Wilby really is a Freemason. He keeps denying it. But man, if you want to look at the agenda, now here I'm sounding, sounding like Gavin Ashton. I apologize before I go wrong, but Gavin is right about a lot of stuff. Yes, he was right about things I'm not too sure. He was very right about safeguarding being a weapon. Yeah. Okay, Gavin introduced that concept that this is here for a good intention it's going to be used for evil yeah he was right he called it before anybody even got but got zinged but the leadership of the church of england on so many levels is failing and even some of the conservative pressure groups they've decided to choose their shots we're not going to talk about this issue because we want to focus all of our strength in here and there and perhaps that may make good short-term political uh, calculus, but standing aside when evil is being done and just being silent, I don't think is 
what we are called as Christians to do. We must stand for truth. We must stand for what is honorable and right and godly and must, be willing to take the consequences. Right, in there. We must stand and be willing to be canceled. You mm -hmm. must be stand and willing to defend your faith and the faith of your brothers and sisters in Christ. You must be willing to be canceled. I mean, that's the cancellation is the 2023 Christian martyrdom. This mm -hmm. is where, uh, <laughs> it's in Revelation, this is where you will be refused your right to commerce. You'll be refused your right to participate in, uh, in politics. You'll be refused your right to participate uh, in society because you stood up and you were canceled. Mm -hmm. that's, mar that's, mar that's common martyrdom right now. We're seeing it amongst uh, little bitty stories in Europe and England and America. That's, that's it, probably till the end time. There was a survey that I saw, the results published yesterday. Mm -hmm. I think it was Barna or maybe uh, the Gallup organization. It looked at a uh, percentage of people proud to be American, uh, who thought religion was important, who thought basically touched on the thing. Oh, in 1998, 72% of uh, people thought were proud to be Americans, and an equivalent number thought religion was important in personal lives. And now the new survey basically shows those numbers of fault or that race relations need to be improved by treating each other with equal, you know, uh, justice being blind, not preferences. In the last 15 years, 20 years, those numbers have fallen in half. And among young people, they're even lower. A minority of young people believe in the value of free speech. A minority of young people believe are proud to be Americans. A minority of young people believe religious faith is important in their life. And that has ch our generations, Kevin, are as different from our children's generations on those metrics. Oh. As has ever been possible, because you know we're really not that different from our parents' generation. Maybe a few points, but not that degree. When I went to public school, my teachers did not make my parents the enemy. Mm -hmm. Okay, my teachers did not make the United States government an enemy. My mm -hmm. teachers did not make religion an enemy. My teachers did not uh, spend three or four hours a day talking about climate disasters and climate change my teachers taught me english which you're probably surprised that i i, I have any grammar at all if you, if you read my writing uh math science my favorite subjects were history uh I, I took a lot of science classes and that is my education base and i had a wonderful uh, church that uh, brought me into a great catechism and understanding of the faith that I still retain today. So I retain my public education, where I was taught to honor my parents, my, my educators, my high school teachers, what, it taught me to honor my parents. Not because they really believed in uh, the biblical uh, Ten Commandments, but they're under the impression, uh, if we can't continue to teach generations to honor the parents, some generation is going to stop honoring parents and then be surprised when they're not honored when they're parents. I, I've yeah. told this anecdote before on this show, so for those who've heard it, I apologize. But when I was 17 years old, uh, uh, I was doing a, I was driving a car for a friend of my mother's child, who was a politician trying to raise money uh, for a run for president. And I picked him up from the airport and took him up from Palm Beach Airport up to Hope Sound. And he sat in the front seat next to me in the Bjork estate wagon. And uh, he asked, he was a very lovely man, polite man. He was a congressman from Texas and had been a former ambassador to China and all that. And he asked me about my hopes and dreams. And I told him, and he said, now remember, George, you are like me. We've been given much in this life and we are expected to give back. The purpose of all of our education, all of we've been given, all that we have had handed to us that so many people don't have is the obligation to give back to your country and to your nation and to the world. A man was named George H.W. Bush. It's 1978, I think it was. Hmm. Um, and 
that worldview, I try to inculcate that in my children. But if I would try to share it with their contemporaries in school, it would be like, you know, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? I mean, if, you know, country, if, you know, A, why should I serve? Why should I give my life up to our country? Why yeah. should I sacrifice, sacrifice yeah. and do the good for the general population through hard work and honesty and labor instead of trying to make it all about me? Um, once we had, now I'm, I don't want to talk about George Bush's policies. No new taxes was a mistake. Okay. Uh, this is six, seven, eight, this is 12 years after, yeah. 12 years yeah. after that he made his, he stepped in the hole and never climbed out about taxes, but Read my lips. <laughs> the, yep. Yeah, the point, the point was that those whom God has given much in this life, much is expected from them. And that worldview is as alien as the worldview of, of the Middle Ages for a current generation in my sad reckoning. And there's the truth. Kevin, you are white privileged. With mm -hmm. privilege comes ex excessive responsibility. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was born into a middle class far, uh, family. Uh, my parents were uh, a generation outside of farmers. Uh, two generations before then was a migration from Europe, and uh, they all worked their ass off so that Kevin uh, had a, a little bit of white privilege. And with that was instilled in me the ability, the desire, the knowledge that everything I have is not for me, it's for the church and for society. Mm. And I spent, and this is humble kevin you're not going to hear me say this often i spend a great deal of my week giving my time my money and my efforts uh to the church and society yeah because and that's why i was that's the way i was raised but this but this i would broaden it this is how our generation was raised yep. if you will and we as americans we as you know, educated people who have the world in front of us, an opportunity there. We're expected to use that for the greater good. Not anymore. All right. Let's move on to story two. I think that went kind of long. <laughs> oh. Welsh bishops? <laughs> yes, Welsh bishops. Okay, so uh, the ANIE has laid ground by uh, consecrating uh, a bishop or two, and the Welsh bishops are kind of offended and they have responded. They give first a cootie warning. How dare you hang out with those people? But it sounds more like they're going DEFCON 4, George. Oh, yeah. Uh, Stuart, Stuart Bell, I think. Yeah, uh, I may have, Stuart Bell was consecrated a bishop for the England Network in Europe to mm -hmm. basically work through Wales. He's former Church in Wales rector and Aberyst with very successful, very, very popular. Excellent choice. Uh, therefore, he'd be terrible in the leadership of the Church of Wales because he actually <laughs> believes in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. <clears throat> and he's successful in growing churches. So well, that's not the type we want. Well, the Welsh bishops put out a cootie warning. Anybody who gets near the ANIE will be warned, uh, uh you know, that's a line you may not cross. And if you do, you will face consequences. These are uh, outside. They sound like Sheriff Bull Connor uh, in the 1960s saying these freedom riders coming down from the north these outside agitators are just outside. trying to unsettle yeah. unsettle our beautiful wonderful southern society they got that long like hair that. they got their yeah 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 it's saying we shall overcome you know man well they gave this warning that uh, consequences will flow if you fraternize if you attend an a and i worship service if you allow one of their clergy into your church all that uh the walls will cave in and you should be dragged straight into hell or cardiff on a wet sunday afternoon which is the same thing and the uh response was nobody cared i hate to say it but they fired their missiles and they hit the target and they went yeah. the they're, welsh they're... are panicking the welsh yeah. church in wales is panicking and nobody cares that they're panicking it's all it's so fun and sad at the same time. They took a BB gun to a war of 
uh, spirits and principalities. You know, and uh, you know, there's a clearly a response from the ACE bishops that we posted on Anglican Inc. But yeah, uh, you have made yourself you, you've ruined the Anglican brand. You made yourself irrelevant in the church and in politics, and now you act surprised when As somebody wants to say, "No, we're going to put a cornerstone and a and a steadfast foundation." Where, where you were apostate. I think somebody was watching a Western the night before they penned the uh, response from the ANIE, because it really does sound like, I could hear John Wayne reading this, a man's <laughs> got to do what a man's got to do. do, and we got to <laughs> go in and bring, save Wales for Christ. So, but it, it really is funny how, uh, funny, not in a ha-ha way, but sort of funny in a sad way, how amusing how insubstantial the Church of Wales is, how unimportant in the world, the Church in Wales press, uh, the, the, the Welsh press, you know, is basically oblivious to uh, these things because it doesn't affect the lives of, of many people. Yeah. You know, it's probably next to the news about latest doings at the Hare Krishna temple. Uh, it's so sad that the Welsh Church in Wales has squandered the inheritance given to them from the saints. Absolutely. And now the ACE is there to restore it and win the country back for Christ. And let me, Scotland is gonna be very hard ground, but I think mm -hmm. uh, it's something that can take hold slowly. Uh, it's certainly something to keep in our prayers. Let's move on to our next story. Um, this is a hard one, but we're gonna talk about uh, Bishop John Howard of the Diocese of Florida who's facing the music now in this position as a journalist and a news reporter for uh, Anglicanism for since 2006, you hear rumors, you hear stories, and you just put them in the back shelf. You know, well, it's probably not true, but it may be true. But now I have this collection of rumors and stories in my head for the last 15 years, and I guess they're more true than I thought they really were about uh, John Howard, but we're not reporting on what we think here. We're reporting on uh, the news outside this. We, we're not going to sit here and have a libel suit or a defamation suit or uh, whatever. This is a ongoing story, and the story is not about John Howard, but about people who are commenting about his uh, time as a bishop. On uh, the Church Diocese of Florida Facebook page, Joshua Lowen Samuels, a young priest, and a disclaimer, I know him. I've F had friend of the show. Yeah. Friend of the show and a visitor to my parish. He had been in Gainesville, which is about 40 minutes north of me. He recounted his experiences with John Howard. He is a conservative evangelical, a, originally from South Africa. He was once what they once called a Cape Colored. He's mm -hmm non-white uh was at uh, uh wickliffe college up at toronto was invited down to the diocese uh ordained and started off as an assistant at holy trinity in gainesville and bishop howard wanted to attract young evangelicals because he wanted to leave the diocese in secure hands when he retired now that's a good ambition and we'll pause there for a moment and then go back in history when John Howard was elected, it was a bit of a surprise. He ran against Ellis Brust, uh, uh, yeah. who, was, who later went, when things fell apart in Florida, moved over into uh, the AMIA, then yeah. the ACNA, and now Ellis is back in the Episcopal Church as a rector in Fort Pierce, Florida. But John Howard was a surprise winner in that vote, and there began a civil war with the conservatives, primarily with Neil Labar, and John Howard refused. John Howard was on the same page theologically, but he, I don't know quite how to understand it, but he essentially created, through his inability to work with other people, the Duck Guises of the Gulf Atlantic. But we've seen this before, just a quick interruption. Bishop Stanton of Alabama, if I even hear of you attending 
uh, it was called the mission or the beginnings of AMIE back then, or an ACN event, you're out. It's Henry Parsley. Henry Parsley. Parsley. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, why did I say? say I'm sorry. Not Stan. Take that back. Henry Parsley of Alabama. He. Yeah. There. Are, there are bishops who want to put up this wall, and mm -hmm. said we agree with their you know doctrine, but we're not going to play with their toys. And so, fifteen years. And remember, it developed so much so that the. Uh, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury put together a task force, mm -hmm. and Rowan Williams investigated and recommended that Sam How uh, Sam Howard allow alternative oversight, and Howard refused and kicked all these people out of the Episcopal Church, and and it was just a fiasco. Well, life goes on, and Howard is as unkind, the liberals say, to them as he was to Neil Lavar and company, and. Uh, Joshua Lowen Samuels recounts his personal experiences where he was a supporter of Charlie Hull, the rector he was working for was one of the candidates against Holt. When it was found out that he was in the Holt camp, he was fired as the assistant. And he uh, looked for a new parish and found one in Jacksonville, and he got a unanimous call from the vestry there. And Howard sat on it. But Howard had turned against him and basically did a pocket veto such that uh, Joshua's visa expired and he had to go back to Canada. And basically, John Howard ruined this man's life, uh, Joshua said. And in fact, he and I was, I knew he, I was in communication with him during this difficult time and I can vouch for the truth of what he was saying about his life at that time. But what to me is surprising is that when he posted this on the Florida Facebook page, the liberals came in all supportive of Joshua saying, you know, this is what he has been doing to us, for, uh, you know, ever since he came. And then the conversation developed saying, poor Charlie Holt is the victim of people hitting back against John Howard because Charlie Holt is seen as Howard's man. Howard hired him after the contested first election. And that was just seen as Howard continuing. And now poor Charlie Holt is going to be hammered for John Howard's dysfunctional interpersonal relations. And this is something you said post-show about nine months ago when there was a first uh, time they started to, to bring uh, questions about the vote for the first time Charlie Holt was elected. Sorry, that was a long sentence. You, you said, Kevin, this isn't about Charlie Holt. You said to me, this is about Bishop Howard and getting back at him. And I, but yeah, right. Well, okay, <laughs> you were right. Do you, you know? remember Tip O'Neill? Yeah, the, that's uh, right, yeah. Speaker of the House uh, under when Ronald Reagan was president, he had a little adage, all politics is local. Local, yeah. And the issue in Florida, it's local. Yeah. It's people taking umbrage at John Howard. And if he says black, they say white. And it's not that they have, you know, perhaps others would have wanted their person to win the election. But Charlie Holt, everybody likes as a person. Mm -hmm. They can live with his policies. But they are just going to stick a knife into John Howard as his, again and again and again. Um, I hate to see, you know, people. You know, poli ecclesiastical politics are like sausage making. You really don't want to know what goes into it to see what comes out. Oh, I know. And vengeance and revenge is really high on the agenda in this Florida situation. Yeah, I remember conversations I had with some participants in a bishop election in Colorado some fifteen or twenty years ago. And you, I think Martin Williams was in there and all that. And just the discussions of what was happening behind the scenes. And I go, why would you want to be bishop of that diocese with what was going on behind the scenes? And there, there are politics that happen at church level that are evil, in my humble opinion. Mm -hmm. And you've seen it. I've seen it. 
And sadly, that is why Anglican Unscripted is successful. On to the next story, George, if you're ready. I am okay. ready. All right. The Dean of Nairobi Cathedral, Sammy Winana, I hope I got that right, is hired by Justin Welby to be a go-between right-hand man with the Global South and GAFCON. And I'm like, wait a minute. You know, that, that's, that's a guy who is pro-GAFCON, very pro-GAFCON, has written uh, documents, letters, and articles telling you why you should be at GAFCON and, and Jerusalem GAFCON. And from all intents and purposes, I would say does not agree with what's happening in the Church of England the last two, two and a half years. What's going on, George? I don't know. I don't know. Um, you can go to Anglican Inc.'s website, and there's a recent article where I reposted an interview that uh, Sammy Wainana in May of 2021 did with Ernie Dido of uh, GAFCON, mm -hmm. where he sings the praises of GAFCON and the importance. And at 2018, there's a I reprinted a, uh, a, a letter he wrote on the Nairobi Cathedral website telling the world why it's vital that we all take part of the 2018 GAFCON conference in uh, Jerusalem. And in the, the earlier, five years earlier, that GAFCON conference in Nairobi, he was the host that was yeah. held at his cathedral. And, and that's where Justin, now, Wel that, and Justin Welby came to that one. Yeah. And he has now been hired to be the Archbishop's advisor on inter-Anglican affairs. So the question is, has Gafcon a man inside Lambeth Palace, or has is you know there's a phrase Paris is worth a mass is uh, uh. is uh, Sammy been a convert to Welbyism uh, in return for a cushy job in London uh, that he can uh, eke out his final years before pension time? I, don't, I think the, the jury really close. needs to see what's going to happen. The jury's out on this, but uh, examples that I don't like to, to point out, John Semtano, mm -hmm. you know, uh, conservative Ugandan, right? Uh, you're mm -hmm. from Uganda, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Went to uh, England and became progressive liberal. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, but this is the third African appointment is made. Uh, Josiah Dawu Ferron as the ACC General Secretary, yeah. and he had Anthony Pogo as his advisor for Anglican Affairs, a South Sudan bishop. Uh, uh, Ferron's and Adawu Ferron, you know, became a real fierce enemy of Gafcon yeah. and of George and Kevin. He had some choice words about <laughs> us, uh, about what we reported <laughs> it was happening in Kenya at the time. Yeah, that's right, remember, uh, yeah. oddly enough, yeah. and. Now, and Anthony Pogo went from being a uh, another South Sudan bishop to being a promoter of the Welby worldview. And now are we going to see that same trajectory of an African who's been bought and paid for, you know, now tow the party line? Now, one of the things I th in the past, uh, General Synod of the Church of England would invite African prelates, uh, Asian prelates, uh, to be guests and allow them to make a speech or two. And in the past, they would always bring people who were amenable to the worldview, people like Tabo Makoba, right. the uh, head of the Archbishop of Cape Town and the head of the dysfunction now dysfunctional Anglican Church in Southern Africa. This time around, they uh, invited uh, Archbishop uh, Sami gotten his last name from from uh, Egypt the Archbishop of Alexandria and the Archbishop of Alexandria told the truth to General Synod and just shocked everybody because usually we get these tame visitors from Central Africa or South Africa or you know people who we know will not rock the boat so to, for me to say completely oh this is a sellouts move no because they didn't choose wisely General Synod with Archbishop Sammy, maybe this is a God move to put somebody who does represent the minds of the Global South in the center of Lambeth Palace to say to the Archbishop of Canterbury, they know you're lying, Your Grace. Uh, speak, you know, you can't say one thing to 
to Jane Ozan, and then another thing to the primates. They read the, they they read Anglican Ink, and they know what you're saying to different audiences is not the same thing. And he so could let's witness see how to this turns out. And he could witness to that because he'll say, when you came to Nairobi, you told the eight o'clock people a different story than you told the ten o'clock people uh, when you spoke yeah. at the. Uh, so. Yeah, we had he had a sermon at eight o'clock hmm. that hit. I, he must have been taken aside by the primates there and said, you do that again, it's over. And at 10 o'clock, 10.30, mm -hmm. completely different theme. Uh, Justin squiggled and wiggled and uh, was able to appease the crowd after, uh, after having been uh, upbraided by his peers. So if I were a praying person, I would be praying for Sammy this next couple of months because the... the the Anglican world, obviously, the, the fabric has been torn. There is a split virtually and physically now. And Sammy may be the guy that can help bring it back together and mend uh, a fix by having better communication between what the Church of England wants to do, and what the Anglican communion as a whole demands he do. <coughs> and uh, it's going to be fun to watch. Communication is our next story, George. Oddly enough. Well, let me just loop back to Charlie Holt because okay. a lot of the criticism that Charlie Holt's had was that when Charlie Holt was in Central Florida, he was a true believer. When he was in Texas, he was a true believer. But he sort of moderated his views to be elected Bishop of Florida. And so it's not just Africans who no. say Paris is worth a mass. That is a very so, good I'm point. I'm sorry, I interrupted no, no. the fellow there. No. Oh, it's okay. Apparently, I'm the only interrupter on the show. That's what I hear in the comments, but it's fine. Did I did I interrupt your interruption? <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> oh. All right. Oh, it's fun. It's fun. All right. So, uh, Oak Hill Seminary, a communication PR disaster. And you and I deal with uh, communication offices from dioceses around the country here, from provinces around the world. And after 15 years, we still struggle. We'll send an email asking for a clarification. And even locally here in America, it could be a week before they get back to us. It could be a month before they get back to us in some provinces around the world. It could be or they never. never I'm still, <laughs> church I'm, house. I, you know, we reported about Lucy Winkett being brought up on charges last two two, three weeks ago, yeah. and I wrote to the Diocese of London that day, and I haven't heard a thing. Yeah. So, you know, they'll never get back to me. The importance... There you go. And, I interrupted you now, Kevin. No, I'll, sorry, I'll be quiet. I, no, no. I'm nattering too much. Nattering. I apologize. It's okay. The importance of true, honest, transparent, clear communication in 2023 cannot be more evident all you look at around the chaos in this whole world a lot of it is because of poor communication poor understanding redefining of words and so when you get a letter from kevin or george asking for clarification just respond or else you will have an oak hill seminary disaster what's going on over there george jonathan jukes the principal of oak hill uh published a letter on the diocese, on the college website saying he was going to step down at the end of the term. And there was no explanation why. And Evangelicals Now, a British uh, newspaper, contacted them that got the cold shoulder, as did other press outlets. And Evangelicals Now responded by basically writing a mystery resignation sounds like an Agatha Christie novel, Mystery at Oak Hill. And if anybody wants to tell us why Jonathan Jukes is resigning and why the old, why the bad blood. And the point being, there's a strand in conservative evangelicalism, which I call the Fletcher effect, that uh, we are going to control the message, we're going to control the medium, and you have no say in this affair. We are going to tell you what to say. I've had people try this with me in the, you know, Church of England for 25 years, 20 years now. The that, EMEA. Uh, Remember the EMEA tried that? 
yeah, yeah. they may try, you know, this is what you can say and not say it, <laughs> Kevin and I, you know, couldn't care less about what they wanted us to say. We were going to say what, what the truth was. Yeah. And the Fletcher effect is still in display in conservative evangelicalism. This is the, uh, the opinion of Julian Mann in an op-ed piece on Anglican Inc., where Oak Hill, by refusing to talk, by refusing to make somebody available to answer basic questions, by it, is there uh, a dispute between different factions in the school? Is there personal animosities? I mean, how should we understand this? But instead of being told, sit down, shut up, and just use the official handout, that basically caused evangelicals now, quite rightly, and Julian Mann to say, uh uh uh, that's, the world doesn't work that way, fellas. You cannot run this show the way you run your parish or some of your parachurch groups. And then that result is that Oak Hill looks like a walking disaster zone. And it may just not be. It may just Jonathan Jukes hit 62 and he's pensioned out and I'm ready to jump. Yeah. Well, we don't know. But we would like to know. It's a simple question. Just, yeah. Oh, by the way, yeah, he's, he's going to go buy a sailboat off the shore and, and enjoy his pension. Yeah. So whatever. And, and you know, it, I know it's a, it's a hackneyed phrase that the cover up is worse than the crime. Yeah. But look what, ha you know, we know what happened with Richard Dixon. We know what happened with Whitewater and Bill Clinton. We know what happened uh, with the Catholic clergy abuse scandal. It was the bishops refusing to be honest mm -hmm. and dealing with this issue. Um, I uh, listened to a lecture the other day. Uh, I was part of a class series of classes I'm taking by a man named Father Rippinger, a Catholic priest. And he was talking about the abuse crisis. He said there was one Catholic diocese uh, that when they found out there were abusers, they immediately laicized them and turned them over to the police for prosecution and then went to the families and said, we will do whatever it takes to make this right. Nice. They have never been sued. And then there are other Catholic dioceses, multiple dioceses who are now bankrupt because when they found about abuse, they reassigned the priest. They didn't tell anybody. They told the victims to shut up, be a good little boy or girl. And now they have, how many billions are now being spent in legal fees and and uh, judgments and Out of whatnot. court settlements, yep. And, Absolutely. and those few, those dioceses, those handful of dioceses that basically manned up immediately and took immediate action to lay aside and turn over to the cops the pervert priests, and then provide counseling, provide therapy, provide support and service, and not walk away from the victims. They've had no troubles. You see the Church of England, you know, Justin Welby, you know, how many years has this been now since he promised to meet with the victims of uh, uh, Jonathan Smythe or, Andrew, you know, or John, uh, John, John Smythe or Aunt Jonathan Fletcher? He's never met with them. Um, you know, the cover-up is worse than the crime in the mind of the public because the narratives now said is that you're inherently untrustworthy. Well, hold on. The John Fletcher one, the, the crime is worse than the cover up. Okay. True. <laughs> okay. But, <laughs> but we have more, sto we have more. Yes. The actual yeah. crime itself is terrible. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Uh, but the stories that follow again and again and again and again and again are the cover up. Yeah. So the volume is on the cover up and that's what people keep hearing. And what you take away from it is, oh, that guy's a scoundrel. But, you know, those bishops that you can't trust them as far as you can throw them. Which is the message right now you should be taking away. Uh, Church of England bishops on as a whole uh, are apostate and untrustable. And uh, we're kind of running low here on time. But you covered that but story. Just, in the just, pre Yeah. Well, just, just, just let yeah. me remember, remember Kevin. If Catherine Jeffords Shorey couldn't get me when I demonstrated on Anglican Inc. and we discussed on Anglican Unscripted her lies, you know, where she lied, yeah. for instance, when she said, oh, I consulted the three senior bishops of the Episcopal Church before I suspended Bob Duncan. So I called the three suspend three bishops, not one of them, John Howe, Hugh, uh, uh, Hugo at, down in Miami mm -hmm. and the Bishop of Texas, not one of them were contacted before. And she lied. 
No, no. They, the three, bi- the three bishop slide. The three bishop slide, George. Bishop slide. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, you know, and all this, all these ruminations started and people started telling Bishop Powell, so you need to get this man to shut up. And Bishop Powell said, was he telling the truth? Well, yes. Well, then live with it. <laughs> live with it. All right. Let's, uh, if let's they couldn't see. get us. If we couldn't get, if we couldn't get us then, they're not going to get me out of it. No. And a good friend of the program always tells me, you know, when we're up against some really bad stuff, you know, you and I have taken hits that we talk about and taken hits that we don't talk about in our 15 years here as broadcasting unscripted. And he says, at the end of the day, no matter what you come against, you're the, you seem to be the last man standing, you know, and yeah, I appreciate that. You know, you're right. Um, I remember the EMEA and, and just going through that, that, that hell in our first, you know, 15 episodes of Anglican Unscripted. And yeah, we, we were the last men standing. Um, cause in the end, truth is supposed to prevail. It's supposed to, you know, uh, the truth will do what Kevin, uh, set, you, set free? you free. Who's I that? hope so. Yeah. That's, I don't think that's uh, whatever. Okay. Uh, we're getting a little uh, rabbit trails. Sorry, people. Uh, I promise this is going to be one of the last stories. Um, do you want to do Welby Ramadan or Scotland? We did the Scotland one already because we talked about yeah. the, that the first story. Yeah. Let's do Welby in Ramadan. Um, uh, uh, well, what? What do you want to talk about? You want to skip it? I can skip it. Oh, it's just, well, no, it's, but it's almost like a yes yeah, so or what? Uh, well, the spouse's universalism in his Ramadan greeting, because, you know, he's getting like George W. Bush, you know, Jesus and Christians and Muslims, we worship the same God. After all, we're part of the Abrahamic family of faiths and and Ramadan's just like Lent. And I wish you a happy Ramadan. And it's OK to have a Muslim mullet at Westminster Abbey on on. Uh, Commonwealth Day, and from the pulpit of Westminster Abbey, go. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. Uh, you know, but okay. Here, you and I come from the seventies. Is this is this a story that is even surprising? Well, no, but let, let, let's back up a second. Yeah, uh, my early Christianity was the in the seventies when all denominations were separated. Okay, the Lutherans didn't talk to the Catholics, the Methodists didn't talk to the Lutherans or Catholics, the Baptists talked to nobody, and you live in small town, rural Minnesota or Wisconsin, your friend base was the people you hung out with in your church because you weren't allowed to hang out with the, the, the Jews on the other side of town. And so uh, there was... There were Jews in rural Minnesota? No, I'm giving an example, okay? <laughs> Stick with okay. the example. All right. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so it, there was no ecumenicalism. There was no uh, understanding of working together and all this. Everybody was a separate unit in a separate kingdom. In the 80s and 90s, there was this built-up relationship building. Uh, the Roman Catholics started to talk to the Anglicans, and yeah, we'll talk to the Lutherans too if they're in the room. And we built up the relationships, but now are we going too far in our understanding of, of ecumenicalism? Are we taking steps that we shouldn't be endorsing and affirming things that are doctrinally uh, evil to our religion? And that's where... Absolutely. Yeah, and that's where you I had think Calvin we Robinson. Ro- you had Calvin Robinson on the last show. The two mm-hmm. of you talked, and Calvin uh, the day before had a sit down with a faithful Muslim, and that was a fruitful conversation because both of them defended the integrity of their faith, pointed out where they were different, and pointed out some of the moral things that they shared, which is completely different from Welbyism and Justin Welby's universal, you know, uh, you know sort of uh, goop is the word I describe, where, you know, instead, Welby seeks to diminish differences by pretending they're not there, by basically suspending reality. And, you know, it's, it's the, it's the, it's the same mental process that can say that uh, a person with male genitalia is really a woman because they think they are. It's the same mental process of suspend. Jesus is 
a prophet, but he is not the son of God, and he did not die on the cross, the Muslim believes. And to paper over that in exchange for nice community relations is a disservice to religion and a disservice to the community. And I just think Welby's approach to that is mistaken. Yeah, absolutely. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 798 of Anglican Unscripted.